John here from Is for Alcoholic again. Today's conversation is with Gigi Langer. We discussed her book, 50 Ways to Worry Less Now. And um, it's an extraordinarily helpful book. Uh, and it just really breaks down some of the many, many principles of not only recovery, um, but also just, well, worrying less. We also talked about alcoholism and drug abuse and promiscuity and all that good stuff as well. But recovering from that, finding um, an ability to change your mind and change your life and change your ways and living a just less stressful, less worrisome, and ideally a, uh, a better life. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Gigi Langer. So Gigi, thank you for doing this. I do appreciate your oh, time. I, I know it took us a while to get um, connected. I apologize for not getting back to you sooner. Sometimes emails just come and go and you don't, you just don't get to see them all. And then you don't see them for months later. So, but no, um, no problem. Um, I am glad to have you here and thank you for uh, sharing your book with me. Um, I just finished it yesterday morning, which both oh, congratulations and, and well done. Um, thank you. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and before we talk about the book, one of the things I always like to know is where people's um, journey began uh, with alcohol, not so much with, not just only with recovery, but with alcohol. Because I often find that um, these things go a lot deeper than just our first drink, right? They start somewhere prior to that, sometimes. Um, did you, where did you, where do you remember your first interaction with alcohol and, and having it in your life? Oh, I remembered very well. I was in high school. I was at a pool party. They had booze. And the next thing I knew, I was jumping off the high dive. And every, and then I, the next thing I knew, I had my arms around the toilet <laughs> and was really sick. Um, and hard, hard alcohol always did that to me. But the best thing was everybody told me afterwards how much fun I'd been and how much fun we had. I didn't even remember it, but I remembered that they liked me more because mm. of it, which was a big deal. And, um, you know, I didn't drink a lot in high school. I would have a few episodes like that. Um, I, it was more episodic, not like binge drinking where I'd go and drink for days, just I would have too much to drink on a particular night and, you know, kind of get sloppy, like uh, with one of my former husbands at a at a military party, party where the general was there, you know, and it was mm -hmm. not a good scene. Um, so situations, uh, another time in college, I got high uh, drinking this punch at the party and um, my boyfriend in that fraternity was out of town and I went home with one of his fraternity brothers. And that next morning I thought, what the hell? You know, so I, I knew to be somewhat cautious about it, but I wasn't into uh, daily drinking. I, it really, when I graduated from college and then uh, got married to, you know, it was going to be the two children, the picket fence, the perfect image. And uh, later I found out that that man was gay and he, I, it, it was a big mess. I was not emotionally prepared for the whole thing that happened with his stepchildren and so on. And um, so I left and I did explain, you know, but I didn't, I was just I was 23, you know, <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but what I did find out is when I left there and went to my cousins who had marijuana, that was the perfect emotional painkiller for me. 
I didn't get sick. I could get high. And I didn't use it every day, but boy, that was the first time I realized how drugs and alcohol could be such an efficient way of getting rid of the pain and disappointment of the world. They really are efficient, aren't they, for a time? <laughs> yeah. For a time. Um, for a time. It's it's and and you talk about the uh the notion of feeling light you know, finding out even in a blackout the next day that you were much more well liked when you were you were drinking. Did you find being liked, uh, being accepted to be difficult growing up? Well, yeah, I would, you know, this thing about the highly sensitive person that one out of five people is needs downtime and, um, it's more empathetic and mm -hmm. um, is more uh, bothered by chaos and so on, and may have difficulty with social stuff. So I was like the youngest of four in my family. I had a very gregarious older sister and um, an alcoholic father and, you know, the fighting and the throwing of things and a worried mother who, by the time I came along, was totally focused on my dad. So I would say I had very little self-confidence. I did, um, you know, start to have a decent figure in high school and looked decent. So I started attracting boys. You know, before that, it was I was getting good grades and that's how I could feel good about myself. Then I was attracting the boys. And that was a great way, you know, and trying to be popular with the girls, mm -hmm. you know, all that stuff. And then, um, yeah, I always felt kind of on the outside of a group looking in, even though I was able to be in most of the groups I wanted to be in. I remember when I quit drinking, standing at a doorway and going to a party and there were a bunch of people in the room and I stood in the doorway and I thought oh now I know why I had to drink just the idea of going in and making small talk and I, I still don't like it much that's why I love talking you know we something about sharing recovery buddies we can be so open and relaxed and and um, totally accepting of one another. And I'm not shy in those situations. <laughs> right. I've had, right. I've had mornings <laughs> where I, I run into uh, acquaintances and, and, you know, I'm like, Hey, how you doing? They're like, it's great. I, uh, I just got back from court and I might get to see my kids again. And I'm like, what, you know, and it's just the, the, the topics of conversation are very heavy, you know, but also it's just, it, it's 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 a little bit more um it's genuine and it's still very happy sometimes even when it's not that's like yeah. it's a relief yeah. to talk about these things that are hard and difficult and that you wouldn't just tell anyone and then you have this group of people who if not understanding that particular moment they understand the feeling of like just oh wow i'm i'm actually dealing with some very heavy stuff but also it feels good to deal with it, which we don't do, right, when we're drinking. Yeah. And I think that um, that's a really good point. And that whole imposter self that I created, I could feel good and secure if I got good grades. I could feel good and secure if I had boys around me, um, if I was popular, well thought of, etc. That is such a house of cards. And and it's so hard to keep it up, the anxiety and the the worry, and then that gnawing at our gut that something's severely wrong, but we don't know what. And so medicating uh, was the answer, even though I didn't have to do it every day, every night. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was just kind of the solution. And you know, that fake buddy at the bar thing, you know, I got all through grad school having a, a cheers type bar where I went every night and I was one of the locals and I felt connected yep. and, you know, and it, it wasn't an authentic connection, but it was soothing. It was better than sticking around with all my feelings. You know, I could 
get high and have some social interaction. <laughs> yeah, which is which is absolutely important. It's just when it's artificially inserted, it has no lasting power and it certainly doesn't help to change. You know, that bad feeling just comes back the next day and often compounded by the physical <laughs> ailments that come with overindulgence and abuse of alcohol. And and the shame of the actions I might have taken, you know, going home with a stranger and, you know, yeah. waking up with that awful feeling. I remember the first morning I woke up after not drinking at all the night before and having been to a meeting and I walked down the stairs and I thought, oh, this is amazing. I'm not thinking about anything awful I did yesterday. What a free feeling. There's almost, it's almost, I remember in the early days thinking, wow, just waking up without a hangover. What a superpower this is. This is awesome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right. um, because I was yes. so used to every morning being in a deficit, like every morning there was, yep. there was a deficit that I had to overcome. Um, so you're drinking in college and you have this marriage that, that does not work out the way that you had imagined and although you're not drinking consistently you're having these these binges that come up um did you when did consequences show up that made you second guess the decision to continue drinking yeah i was kind of a chameleon person so I did what my man did, you know? Mm -hmm. So the first husband after I left that, then I found a guy that I, um, who was 17 years older and he didn't drink a lot. And so we traveled around and lived together and actually got married, in a in a, a legal way because we wanted to travel together and we were going to Catholic countries. So it mm -hmm. was dissolvable at any time. You know, this is the seventies. We were terminally cool, right? Mm -hmm. And then after we dissolve that and we get into the, you know, the late seventies, then um, another guy was living with, and he didn't use much. So really very few episodes up until I got to um, graduate school. And that was the every night cheers bar, but I still found I could drink, you know, to a certain level and then uh, avoid the hangover. But at the end of grad school, I had been married and divorced twice. And I met a guy from, this was in California. I was going to grad school. I met a guy from Michigan and he was not older, you know, not a lot older than I was. He seemed to really have his shit together. I thought, okay, this is it. You know, I've been smoking dope every night through grad school. It's time to get my act together. So we fall in love really fast, just like every other one. I moved to Michigan. Um, we get, I met him in February, we got married in November and, you know, it was the whole fantasy rose colored glasses thing. Well, he traveled, um, <laughs> and I am in Michigan and I started within nine months of marrying him. I went out to a bar on the night that he was gone and picked up a stranger and went home with him because he had marijuana and slept with him. And that's when I went to a psychologist. <laughs> and I said, there is something wrong with this picture because yeah. I have this, you know, degree and blah, blah. And then I have this, I, and I did that several times actually, before I did go to the therapist and I said, you know, there's something wrong. I have this little secret seedy life, you know, on the side. And then this looking good life. Oh, it was, it was the disparity was excruciating. And um, so that was, that was when I realized this is a problem. I'm doing things, you know, that are grossing me out, endangering me, dr driving really drunk, and obviously lying to my third husband, you know, that was a big <laughs> yeah. red flag. So the psychologist said, um, 
he got my family history and he said, well, you're in the early stages of alcoholism. You have it in your family. It's only going to get worse. If you want to see if you really have a problem, try having two drinks and stopping. So I did that experiment for six months. And I, I don't think I went out and picked up strangers anymore, but I would have two drinks. And sometimes I'd have the third drink, the fourth drink, stay at the bar and close it down. And sometimes I would go home with a stranger actually. And other times I'd have two drinks and stop. And then I'd have two drinks and keep going and finish the bottle of wine at home and get sloppy. Mm -hmm. And over six months, I realized there is no way I can predict that I will make good, safe decisions if I put one drink in my body. Yeah. So I had to stop. Yeah. I, you know, I know a couple of people who have been successful in looking at it as an experiment. Now, I, I it never occurred to me. I kind of just crashed and burned one day and I was like, I have to do something and I don't know what, but this idea of, of experimenting with the drinks and going, I'm just going to have two and realizing, oh, that doesn't work. And then maybe, maybe I can just have one and, and no, and understanding that it, it, and for me as well, it flips this switch and I can't turn the switch off until I make myself go unconscious most times is what it was for me. It was just to the point of, of blacking out and, or just passing out, you know, obviously near the end, a lot of the, um, the lot, a lot of the drinking I did was in my bed, in my bedroom. I didn't leave. I just had the bottle of vodka under the bed so that it wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. Blacking out, passing out wasn't a problem. I was already in bed. Um, but it's always interesting to me to hear about these experiments that we try and hopefully, you know, and thankfully in your case, you said, Oh, wait a second. So I failed this experiment failed, which means something's wrong and I have to quit. Um, did you quit right after? that well thankfully i was in therapy okay. during that six months and <clears throat> i had uh couples therapy with the same guy uh, but my husband didn't come very often because he was traveling and i don't know mm -hmm. um, and he was a counselor he knew about alcoholism his father had gotten into recovery way before my ex-husband um, but I didn't talk with him about it. Uh, I did the therapy, but one night and later I found out he'd been going to Al-Anon. So anyone who's in love with someone or loves someone who has an alcohol or drug problem going to Al-Anon family groups is very helpful. And I guess that's what allowed him not to try to control me or not to mm -hmm. talk to me about it just to let me have my own process. He knew I was going to therapy and so on. But one night, and I, you know, I think we talk about synchronicity and the higher power and who knows what that is, but sometimes there does seem to be a force for goodness that gets things to happen that are really helpful. <laughs> and here's what happened that night. We're having dinner. I order a beer. And I'm drinking the beer. And he said, what would happen if that was the last drink you ever had? And I just, he never talked to me about my drinking before. I mean, four years before he had seen me drink before he married me and saw the personality change. But right. anyway, here we are four years later. And I thought, wow, what would that be like? And then he knew the next night there was one of those places. This is 1986. Okay. Mm -hmm. So AA 12 steps was about the only game in town. Right. And there was a place where they had an Al-Anon meeting in one room and at the same time, an AA meeting and he knew about it. So the next, I think it was the next night we went there. And of course I walk into the room, there's all these guys, older men, 
smoking like chimneys. I'm 38. Um, and I sit down and I start listening. I can't even figure out how I got the willingness to go. It was mm -hmm. just one of those golden moments, you know, but anyway, I'm listening. And of course I got it. I, I didn't feel comfortable, but I understood what they were saying. They had the same problem I did. They didn't, you know, they'd done horrible things too and worse. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, I'm, it's not that I'm, a defective human being, you know, I have a disease. How about that? You know, and yeah. they talked about having the, you know, obsession to want to drink. And then the, um, you know, the, the allergic reaction to want to keep drinking. And it just, it made sense. And I, yeah. you know, I was really into, I was into, um, the psychology of learning. So I was very much understanding how the mind and the body can, can act and, and get us to do things, you know? Mm -hmm. So what they were talking about made perfect sense to me. I thought, my God, that's me. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and things were changed from that point on. I mean, was that your last drink, that beer at dinner? Yeah, it was. I, I went to another meeting the next day. It was a women's meeting because some of the people had suggested that. And that meeting, I remember really well. And I remember being, well, relating to the women and liking the women. But I also remember, thank God, no one asked for my phone number because I don't want them calling me. Because I had tried to be in other groups that were quasi- religious and mm -hmm. that was always the mo they would chase after me and i hated it so right. it was so nice that nobody asked. it's like you call us if you'd like to chat you know here's my number yeah it was just great yeah yeah and i was very lonely because i was in michigan i'd been there well by this time three or four years maybe three years but i I didn't have many friends except the people at the bar, you know, and those weren't quote friends, mm -hmm. not what I needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It makes a huge difference. I know in the early times people would give me in the early days of my sobriety, there was one gentleman in particular who gave me his phone number and I don't know why I, I, I singled him out or whatever, but in my mind, I was so angry. And so I guess I was resentful at somebody who was trying to help me. And, you know, I've since understood that it was simply like, Hey, here's my card. And I was like, you, you know, my reaction was, you don't know me, you don't know my problems. And, and obviously I've come to find out that he knew exactly what my problems were and, and many of them, right. Most of them. And it was just a funny thing to be like, there's, here's a person who's trying to help me and I'm, I'm angry at them. And, and it took a long time to get past that, but definitely there was very little of the, um, like you said, there was, there wasn't much of a push in the beginning. Once I started asking for help and then people were like, Hey, John, are you doing your thing? We need to talk about you doing your thing. And I'd be like, get off my back. And they're like, well, you know, what are you doing here? And these were people who had become friends at that point. And so the relationship had certainly changed, but it was great because I would just go and sit and listen and leave. And that worked for a while until I was like, maybe I should do more. Right. And then I asked and I received, you know, much more help than I ever could have imagined. Um, and so you, right. you begin to create a it community. Takes... Um, exactly. Did you find I, that? I'll talk about. Yeah, yeah. please go ahead. I just want to, because I have to acknowledge that that therapist was also suggesting that I go to AA, the therapist I had been seeing. Mm -hmm. And um, it turned out later, I found out he was in AA, <laughs> but I did kind of like you did, you know, I tiptoed around the outside of it 
um, I went to three meetings a week, which to me seemed like an awful lot. Yeah. And I, I wasn't drinking or using. I don't, you know, it was a miracle to me that I wasn't. But it took me a full six months of doing three meetings a week before I asked someone to be my sponsor. And, you know, found a, a, a the sun, Saturday morning women's group that where there was finally no smoking, where I heard a woman talk, you know, and really liked what she said, and the people recognized me, and they were nice, and so on. And finally, I took that plunge, because I didn't reach out to any of the people who'd given me their phone numbers. <laughs> I was just thinking, I'll go to meetings, and, you know, maybe that'll help. But getting the sponsor, of course, I kept hearing all these other women saying, oh, I called my sponsor and my sponsor and I did this. And mm -hmm. I kept thinking, oh, I want a sponsor too. <laughs> so finally I took the plunge and, you know, that was a big help, but I didn't think I was worth anyone's time. I didn't think I was worth a sponsor's time. I just didn't get it, you know, yeah. but now I understand how helpful it is to the sponsor and the sponsee. <laughs> right. I mean, it's a it's a symbiotic relationship in that um, certainly helping somebody and teaching them what you have learned helps to reinforce those things that you have learned. Right. I mean, it's not without it's not without benefit for both parties. And yep. when you realize that. And you realize that I just need to come in here and do play my part and that's it. And then, and then go on. And also, you know, I think there's a, a lot of the trepidation with a sponsor for me and I've heard from others is that, well, then I'm, I'm locked into this relationship and I have got to, you know, do my homework and I've got to commit to this and I've got to commit to that. And you know, I've heard it said, you don't have to marry the guy. You don't have to marry the person. Like you can just, you just go and do the thing. And I have told people too, like, Hey, if this is not working out, you can leave at any time. You know, this is not, um, this is not something I will never force you to do anything because <laughs> it won't work. You and I both know that. Right. <laughs> so, um, right. So you found a sponsor and it was worth their time and your time, I assume. Um, do you still have that same sponsor or did that work out first? It worked out really well. And um, I, she, she's not my sponsor now. She had to move to get a teaching job because there weren't any in Michigan. So after mm. a few years, she moved and I got a new sponsor. Um, and then... Now I have a different sponsor, but we've both been sober 30 years and I started as her sponsor and she's a social worker and pretty soon I found myself when she didn't have big issues, I would bring my issues to her. So yeah. now we sponsor one another um, and that, you know, that's working out great now. And the key thing, you know, my first sponsor, we would, I think one thing I've learned is regular meetings with my sponsor. So part of why my current sponsor and I work so well together is that um, we used to meet for breakfast every two weeks. You know, we did that for 20 some years until COVID started. I moved to Florida. She stayed in Michigan. So then we started, you know, on the phone every week because COVID you know, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so we're still talking every week. And um, I know with my sponsees, I try to make it an every two weeks kind of meeting or talk on the phone. Um, because I find that if I leave it to I'm going to call my sponsor when I need her, I'm sometimes the last person to know until it's really severe that I need to talk to someone. Yeah. So if I have the regular meetings, 
it's sort of like, oh, I didn't realize that this was bothering me. But now that we're talking, you know, my my higher power kind of brings it up to the top of my mind, whatever it is I might need to work through. Um, and it re works really well. Yeah. So I like regular meetings with sponsors and sponsees. Can you so when I went through my uh went through the process with my sponsor at one point um i think i was i don't remember exactly what i was complaining about um there were a lot of things to complain about but he stopped and he paused and he said john there are going to be some things i simply cannot help you with and you're going to have to seek outside help and he was very blunt about it and he was very accurate can you speak a little bit about the importance of both being in a sponsorship relationship, being in a 12-step program and uh, therapy at the same time and how they're different, but both helpful? Yeah, the therapy, I mean, I wouldn't have even gotten into recovery without the therapy because he, in a very gentle way, helped me become honest and uh, look at the consequences but then once I stopped drinking and I wasn't um, hiding from myself anymore, mm -hmm. you know, my sponsor, I feel like the sponsor's responsibility is to lead the person through the steps at the pace that you and your higher power and that person feel is the best for all involved. And I also believe that the issues that come up as we're working through the steps come up in the perfect order. I think maybe people hesitate to get into therapy or recovery because they fear like I did. I'm going to go in there. I know I have all this shit down there that's been making me feel awful forever. I'm afraid if I rip the Band-Aid off, it's going to come gushing out and it's going to ruin me and my life and I won't be able to handle it. So that might be a fear going into work with a sponsor and it might be a fear going into work with a therapist. What I found is when the shit comes out, well, in my fourth step, that's where we think all that shit's gonna come out, right? Mm -hmm. So my first fourth step, my higher power only allowed me to see the alcoholism and the patterns with the alcoholism and my self-deception and so on. The next time I went through the steps, the next layer came in the house cleaning, which was the dysfunctional family, adult child of alcoholic, perfectionism, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until my four year of sobriety that I realized that there had been some sexual touching that had happened in my home to me. Mm -hmm. And no wonder I had all these divorces. And all. Well, obviously, for something like that, you go to a therapist. And I actually got a new therapist at that point, prayed my ass off before I made three phone calls. And the one that came back that felt right is who I went with. And she was the perfect person. She had a group of women that worked together other on things so um obviously if it's a deep-seated scary kind of thing that seems to be sabotaging my my life over and over again that is the territory for a therapist the steps help us access a higher power help us get honest help us own our negative patterns and what we were trying to accomplish with that negative pattern you know how we were trying to make ourselves secure instead of letting god do that but i think some of the deeper issues you know people call them core issues of insecurity um i call them in my book the whispered lies the mm -hmm. the th negative things we tell ourselves about ourselves and other people oh one of mine was you know you can't trust men because they always hurt women well, you know, after I got my third divorce and I met my fourth husband that I've been married to for 33 years now, I had a big whispered lie. You can't trust men. Don't trust. You know, so finally I took a long time getting to know him 
but it was also being helpful in therapy to work through my terror of trusting a man, mm -hmm. learning how to express my feelings. That's not the job of a sponsor, you know, <laughs> um, learning how to look at what happened to me in the past and how it affected me, but it doesn't define me now. I mean, I think a, the steps really helped me get a higher power that showed me that it could keep me sober. And it showed me that I could overcome my anxiety and my tension and my perfectionism and so on. And it, when I went into therapy, I had that honesty and that higher power to help me heal uh, a lot of the things that, you know, were maybe outside the 12 steps. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's, that's a great, a great answer. Um, I sometimes come across people who have difficulty with the higher power. And by sometimes I mean quite a bit early in early sobriety, right. Um, for a myriad of reasons. Um, most of which is, usually from some deep-seated resentment toward um, organized religion as a child. And um, so I guess I'm wondering what you might say to somebody who goes, higher power, I made the decision to quit drinking. I'm the one doing the work. I'm the one going, you know, I am the one doing it. Why shouldn't I get some of the credit here? <clears throat> because that's what I hear a lot. Absolutely. Yeah, and I do too. Um, I my new book is um, really looking at the idea, trying to avoid the lang the God language, mm -hmm. um, and using the idea of an open hearted stance toward life. That the goodness can be, it comes from other people, of course. It comes from a you know, some, maybe it comes from outside of us. Uh, but I'm talking about the true self, like Deepak Chopra and other the wisdom traditions, you know, they, uh, but, it, and, and in the book that you read, just finished, you know, worry mm -hmm. less now, it's, uh, you have to name it yourself. But here's the bottom line. It has to be a power greater more good, more smart, more wise than my fear-driven way of living. If I can acknowledge, and I remember the first moment in a meeting when I realized that I was full of fear because I was a gal who rode horses and jumped high fences and played t singles tennis with the men and skied. And, you know, I was, I, I, I uh, thought I was fearless, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting at a meeting and this guy, he's got uh, black leather pointed boots and black pants and a black shirt and slick back black hair, um, became a dear, dear friend later. But I heard him say, I am anxious almost all the time. Mm. I'm scared shitless almost all the time. Mm -hmm. And I have my higher power, my, uh, how it, he, I think he had a native American practice because here's one thing, getting sober in Ann Arbor, Michigan, tons of different approaches to spirituality and, and higher yeah. power and so on. But once I could acknowledge that I was a fearful person, and that my fears had driven all those bad decisions, then I realized I need some power that was bigger than my own fear and wiser than, you know, could provide nudges and intuitive. And of course, you know, listening to the promises, we will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us, you know, I mean, so locating that power in the intuition or in my true self or however people need to find it, uh, as yeah. they say, as we understand it, but it's not, I don't think it can be pinned down because it's of a uh, 
consistency, a composition that is in our human senses, we are unable to really grasp it. We can only experience the power of it. Yeah. So something was keeping me sober. Something was keeping those people sober. There must be something greater than my fear. Yeah. I've heard it. Um, <laughs> I've heard it uh, described as a metaphor. And somebody said, well, a metaphor for what? I'm like, well, that exactly, because we don't know. And that's fine. Um, I'm, we can spend the rest of our lives arguing that point, or we can move on and try to just be a little bit happier, you know? And I think that a little more content, a little more satisfied, a little more anything but what we were before, which, as you stated, was fearful. I was always afraid. Um, yep. And there were fun times, but I was always, I always ended up being alone and afraid at the end of the night. <laughs> Almost exactly. inevitably, always. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's great. I mean, finding finding a different way of uh, finding a power that's bigger than your fear. And I think that's, that puts, that puts a point on the question that I had not thought of. Um, I want to talk mm -hmm. about this book that you sent me and I really enjoyed it. Worry less now. And, uh, for anyone who's interested, I highly suggest, uh, going to check it out. Um, but let's talk about, you mentioned the whispered lie and I've heard this used, uh, I've heard this described as like a negative tape is what it was originally described to me as, and we don't really use tapes anymore, mm -hmm. but, um, so the whispered lie is the negative thinking that creeps into our heads or was put there by someone perhaps at a very young age. Um, right. what is that? And how does one, how do you shift that? Good question. The, so I called it worry less now because I do believe I've been the queen of worry, <laughs> the former queen of worry. But, um, you know, even in early cognitive therapy, they had you listening to the thoughts, you know, that feel good by, was it David Burns in the 80s? I mean, it was mm -hmm. a model of therapy where you started noticing how you talk to yourself. And so that's the essence of it. Am I uh, believing about myself negative things or am I believing positive things? So when we grow up in dysfunctional families, um, there's a lot of negative scripts that we adopt and they actually, the cognitive science is that they're kind of burned into our neural pathways in our brain, but not permanently. They can be reprogrammed. So that the whispered lie, I mean, they can be about me, you know, I'll never be happy in a relationship. Uh, I must perform perfectly to be loved. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to handle it if my husband passes away. Right. Uh, they can also be about other people. Um, that person should stop drinking. Those politicians should do blah, blah. Right. So it's any time that we're creating these rule, these rules in our minds that are unenforceable and, and, and meaningless because they're only based on the past. Mm -hmm. So we learned these things in the past, they went, and then they're kind of little handicaps. So a lot of people talk about as they work through their character flaws, uh, those are old patterns that used to serve us well, like overachieving. It used to give me a feeling of security, but then the cutting edge of the overachieving is the perfectionism and the anxiety and the false belief, the whispered lie, I can't be loved unless I'm at the top of the heap. So it's a insidious kind of a thing. And so the whole book is really like, how do we, uh, 
all these tools, it says 50 ways to worry yeah. less now. And so as I went through my, I think when I started writing it, I'd been 20, almost 20 years sober. Um, I had had different, well, the relationship issues we knew about already, but then uh, health issues and disability issues temporarily, thank God, and uh, anxiety issues. And, you know, I would have these things happen in my life. And because I was in therapy and I was in recovery, I uh, and my, you know, whatever we want to call that higher power thing, brought me the right tools, you know, serendipity. I, someone would run across a parking lot to say, oh, I found this book and it's really great. You've just got to read it. Well, I'd never had that happen. The book was perfect for what I needed in that moment of time. So what I did in the book was I said, geez, I've learned all these things over the years. How about if I put them in a book, but I'll introduce it with a story about, you know, how I had this problem in my life or someone else and how I discovered the tool. I call them 50 tools mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a little bit of research about it, you know, tiny little bit that this tool does have research behind it, like positive thinking. There's a good research for the law of attraction and positive thinking. And, and then uh, it's like, I'm a former teacher. So I created those little exercises where yeah. it's not a, textbook you don't have to do every exercise or use every tool but you will know which ones might be helpful as you read the book yeah what i found is that you when you you say okay it's time to do this exercise or whatever um many of them i have already kind of done mentally or some of them I, it's like that's just a process that now and i'm only only seven years sober, but that's a process that I go through now where I'm like, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to think about this. I'm going to, you know, take a moment or um, whatever the the thing might be about my worry and refocusing it or um, analyzing it in a different way. These are things that I do now regularly. And so I don't know, I'm, I, it would have been helpful to have it laid out for me more so in the early days. Um, and I think it's a great resource. One of the other, the big ones, and there's, there's, there's many of them in here, but is the um, writing and journaling. And um, it's something that I have told people time and time again, um, and that I've tried to help is writing something out. And it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be for anyone else. I don't have to read it. It doesn't need to be homework, but the act of writing for me has been something that is very, um, it's now kind of an anchor to my day in the morning. So even if those journal entries are the most boring, uh, you know, two and a half pages about coffee and cats and the thing that happened or how I slept or what hurts in my body that day, um, I find it helpful. And ultimately, sometimes nuggets come out, things, epiphanies come out, or stories come out that I'm like, hey, I need to keep that and rewrite that and put that together. Um, so can you can you tell me about the importance of writing, not just in your published works, but in your personal experience? Yeah, it's a great tool. A lot of people say, I don't like to journal. I don't like to write. And so I don't know that it's for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's worth giving a try though, because that this uh, book that's sold so many copies called the artist's way mm -hmm. it's uh, by Julia Cameron. And it's not just for artists, but anyone trying to do anything in their life really, <laughs> but she has morning pages, what she suggests. And you fill like three pages every morning or set a timer and write free, write. It's, it's a beautiful way of getting stuff out on the page so we can look at what's going on in our minds. So sometimes when I write, it, 
in my process, I tend to work well. If I I usually don't write until I'm feeling pretty screwed up, and then I write. I do tend to write. What am I telling myself? You know. Huh. Well, I can't believe that da 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 da, and that person did that, and that scared the shit out of me. And gosh, what am I afraid of? Well, I seem to be afraid of this or this. And then sometimes I go, I can write even the the steps on it, like um, perfectionism. I'm powerless over my perfectionism. How am I powerless over that? Well, it makes me tense. It makes da 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 da. And then I take step two on perfectionism. You know, can I be restored mm -hmm. to sanity? Well. I'm not drinking. And then step three, step four, step five. So um, however a person finds writing helpful, and I think different ways help different people, taking a journaling workshop is really worth it. Um, I have a friend, Harriet Hunter. I don't know if you've, she has a daily meditation book called Miracles of Recovery. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. But she also has an online course, you know, a a pre-recorded journaling course and What's her, her name, name is again? harriet hunter okay harriet hunter got it um and she'd be a great person to have on your podcast too she's funny and inspiring and a big huge heart very wise uh but anyway she she really uh has a nice uh format for learning to journal and I do agree with you. It's a, it's a great way to help ourselves through a difficulty and a good habit to have every day. Yeah, uh, I've been doing it for the last, I don't know, four or five years now. And there's been a handful of times where I have forgotten for one reason or another and thought, oh, gosh, uh -huh. and then come back and either um, uh finished it the night before or the night the, the night of when I come home and I'm like, I forgot to mm -hmm. write in my journal. Or mm -hmm. ironically enough, there was two weeks I was taking a writing course. And so I was in class, I was reading essays, I was having to write essays, and then um, read them to the class. And so I was busy with writing stuff completely forgot about my journal because I was like so focused on on these other things so I mean well I'll forgive myself for those days that I didn't get in there but um it was definitely sure. the artist's way that got me into that loop that has been that now there's boxes of notebooks in my or there's a box of notebooks in my closet that I I don't know what I'm going yeah. to do with one day yeah. um but yeah it's very <laughs> helpful I think I think um, having a morning routine, mm -hmm. a morning routine that connects us to our open hearted, true self, that connects us with ourself and the best of ourself. For me, it's a um, guided meditations yeah. are very helpful for me. Um, and I, I found that I cannot write anything that's very helpful to anyone unless I have done a little bit of meditation beforehand and like connecting to my true self and getting some of the stuff out of the way. And I wanted to mention that if there was one mega strategy for overcoming worry, mm -hmm. I would say it would be meditation. However, it's not the meditation that people think about where, oh, I can't do that because I can't empty my mind. The kind of meditation that's most helpful, and it's not where the goal is to empty my mind. The goal is the mindful meditation where I choose anything to focus on, my breath or a thought, whatever. But the point is, I'm going to watch my mind and I'm going to try to get my mind to focus on my breath. Well, there it goes. It's back worrying about my grocery list. So then I just gently notice that and switch it back to my breath. And then my mind goes back to something else and I switch it back. So one of the things I believe is that if we're tortured by our whispered lies to negativity, we need to learn how to change our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't change a thought until we can see it. And 
meditation allows us to see it and then it gives us practice in switching it to something either neutral or positive so if it's an affirmation that you know the book is turning out the way it needs to be for the readers and it will be that way and then i go back to oh my gosh what about so even something like the golden key what do we mm -hmm. learn in the rooms which is noticing our worry negative thought and then switching it to a thought about god as originally but it can be toward anything positive you see it's the same skill we develop in in uh, meditation notice a thought make a choice put it where i want it well it's going to go back again right yeah. notice a thought and then put it back where where it's going to do some good because it's connecting with something positive and loving rather than fearful yeah yeah um i used to meditate a lot more than i i do i did every so often now and um but one of the things that got me into it because it's always it's my my i'm i can be kind of cynical about all these things i have in the past and um it's very easy to come into this thing and be like meditation I was listening to a podcast and the host was talking to this gentleman and um, the host was mentioning meditation uh, to his guest and the guest started bringing up, said, oh yeah, I meditate. And the host was very excited because this was not the typical type of person you would think would be uh, someone to meditate. And he'd be, he's like, so what is your, what is your routine? He says, well, I wake up, I go out in the morning, I light an unfiltered cigarette and I plan my day. And um, you could argue that is or isn't, but if it works for you, like fantastic. And so that was the thing that really kind of inspired me to go, oh, it doesn't have to be a certain way or for a certain amount of time or in a certain, it, I'm not failing by not doing it or not, or, or missing a day of my meditation. You know, I had a meditation app and I did it for 46 days straight. And then I missed one. And I was like, I have failed. I have ruined everything. That's not true either. Right. Um, right, so, right. so it's however you get to these things and however they work for you. That's most important. Higher power, meditation, exactly. writing, yep. you know, so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, forming, forming a positive intention for the day. You know, I mean, that is, if you say I'm planning my day, well, I'm saying, okay, let me be of service. Mm -hmm. Help me, um, you know, say whatever might be best for the listeners of the podcast. You know, those are intentions that mm -hmm. I can use to plan my day. Right. Yeah. Um, so it depends, I guess, if we are totally relying on our own self-will, that it has to be a certain way, or it has not to be a certain way, or if we leave that wiggle room for the magic of the um, higher power, where we say, well, you know, I, I want to have this book succeed, but for the best of all involved, it's not about me. Right. It's about the reader. Right. That's a big switch. We have to learn not to rely on ourselves for our security and to rely on uh, our true selves or our open hearts for yeah. security. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to take up too much of your, more of your time. Uh, just, I would say to anyone um, who's listening and thinking about recovery and finding help, what what is a what is a good piece of advice for starting in this whole process? I think that it really, whatever program you choose, because there are several out here now to help people get sober and clean, that um, you need a guide, a loving guide, and you need some kind of uh, structured program. Yeah. So the first step, obviously, is to get clean and sober. And whatever program is going to help you do that, that's the place to start. I often say that my book is most helpful to people who've been through the steps or at least through step seven, mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's most helpful after you've done the inventories and kind of looked at some of those habits you've formed that are now seen as self-defeating and mm -hmm. hurting yourself and others. So um, I think my book is, I do know a couple of people that have been 12 stepped by my book, however, a person who never thought he had a problem. And then he read mm -hmm. the book and found out oh. because I didn't write it just for people in recovery. Right. Um, that's, that's why there are some of the tools from recovery, right? But illustrated, um, you know, as for an everyday person. But there's a lot of things in there that you don't learn in the rooms, like the masterminding and the um, Byron Katie's technique called the work, and so on. Some of them require a little more training. But I've given real co uh, concrete examples. Radical forgiveness. If there's a person in the past that just every time you think about them, it grinds your gut. Radicalforgiveness.com, free tools, great stuff. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, where can people find this book and your your work in general? Yes. Well, I have a website. It's G-I-G-I uh, Langer, L-A-N-G-E-R, G-G-Langer.com. That's pretty easy. On there, I have a blog with a lot of, I've written a lot about, you know, how important is this word God and stuff about sobriety, a lot on there of my blogs. And I have a lot of videos on there, YouTube too. Um, and on there, there's also a link for the book. So the thing is to buy the book at Amazon, it's almost twice as much as buying it for me to send you an already printed copy Mm -hmm. with a personal signature on it. So what I'm in, you know, you can pay Amazon if that's easiest, but if you want to pay half almost, you go to gglanger.com and then uh, look for the book and hit or, or slash buy, B-U-I, and I mail it to you, you know, no shipping right. and uh, with a signature on awesome. it. Awesome. That's, so, yeah. that's how I got mine. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's fantastic. Right. Um, well, Thank you so much for your time and your wisdom and your sobriety and um, and the book and all of it. I mean, it was really nice to meet you and chat with you today, really. I loved it. I loved it, John. And I hope we get to see and talk to one another again someday <laughs> if yeah i mean if you're Thank on this you. side of the country or i'm on that side of the country let's let's hit a meeting mm -hmm. i'd be yeah. i'd be totally open to that great mm. great thank you so that much thanks again for listening our music as always is by neglect you can find more of his stuff at neglect.bandcamp.com and you can find us on all social media platforms that matter instagram facebook and twitter and you can reach us at a is for alcoholic at gmail.com Talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs>